My name is Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams. I'm from the University of Cape Town and I work for a department called the Centre for Innovation and Learning and Teaching. And um, I was approached nearly 18 months back to be part of a planning group to look at open education resources in the Global South. There'd been an earlier project on open education resources in Asia and uh, Professor Raj Dhanarajan had been involved in that and the Canadian um, research uh, organization called the IDRC, they'd been involved in that project and they'd asked Raj if he would put together a group of people who could advise, plan on a new research project that looked not only at Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia, but at Sub-Saharan Africa and South America. That was held, um, that meeting was held in Chiang Mai in Thailand and at that meeting um, we set up a, a proposal for um, a call and well we started it and uh, I was asked to take over from Raj as the principal investigator for this project. Raj is still involved in the project, but he felt that um, he would like to take a, a lesser role, although I think right now he's probably even got a bigger role. Um, and so we've started to form what is now called the Research um, on Open Education Resources for Development in the Global South. And uh, the abbreviation is R, OER, 4D, pronounced raw, as in lion raw. So um, it is a little tricky the first time you see it, but um, it was the easiest one we could actually think of at the time. Now, the start for Raw for D was in fact um, trying to find evidence for some of the claims that have been made around the value of open education resources. Um, specifically for increasing access to uh, students in higher education, um, improving the, the quality of education, um, because we in the in the global south area we don't necessarily have sufficient teachers. We don't necessarily have um, sufficient um, resources for people, and of course reducing costs is therefore really important. So it was really trying to find evidence for that because much of the research has actually been done in the global north. So there's a bit of a gap in the global south. So the project actually has four main objectives. Um, apart from trying to build on the knowledge base of, of OER and in finding evidence for some of these claims, um, it's also a development project. So we are in the first instance helping people network because often people um, are very isolated in the work they do. I mean I come from Cape Town um, in South Africa which is at the tip of Africa, hours and hours away um, from the Euro usual European uh, conferences and likewise for my colleagues who are in Southeast Asia or in South America. So the idea is to network um, and build up that network of scholars so people know who to talk to about what. Then also to build research capacity. Um, much of the research work has been undertaken in the Global North and even some of the research work that's been undertaken in the Global South has been undertaken by researchers from the Global North. So what we're trying to do is actually build the capacity, um, enhance the capacity of uh, researchers on OER in the Global South. And then we hope uh, to curate openly um, our research, not in the findings, but um, the data, all the materials actually leading up to the final reports, um, and then communicate this as we go along. So we've made a very strong commitment to open research. And I think we're one of the very few um, research project that actually has an open requirement um, in the actual contract um, that the researchers signed. So we feel we've made some progress, 
but a lot of it is still discovering as we're going along. Um, so we, we're very keen to learn from groups such as yourselves from the OER Research Hub um, about practices that worked for you that we can follow and if there were any tricky things um, that you help us work around them before we face them. So we're very open to be learning from other projects. Well, I probably will be able to answer this question better a little further into the project because at the moment um, we're still discovering the nuances between the different challenges. But I think in terms of contrasting some of the key differences between the Global South needs and what we, we, we've got a particular understanding of the Global South, it's not a geographic location, um, it really is um, uh, those particular three regions we're looking at. But in comparison to um, the Global North, we have got increasing numbers of students. We, in fact, um, the conversation at this conference um, as in Europe has been around decreasing numbers of students. Um, we have, like Europe, we've got pressure on our institutions because of you know, financial constraints. Um, but in many ways, they, from two different perspectives, um, the Global North have got too few students coming into the institutions and therefore there is a, a challenge and institutions are competing with each other. Whereas in the Global South, we have so many students um, that even if the, the institutions were actually operating in capacity, we would still not have sufficient institutions. So we've got less of a competition competitive challenge I think than perhaps um, universities in the, in the global north so yes it's to do with um, increasing student numbers increasing costs um, and depending on which part of the education sector you're talking about um, higher ed not so much but certainly in secondary and primary education we do have severe challenges around quality of um, the provision of education and that is related um, not only but to um, other outdated materials or non-existent materials um, and perhaps underprepared teachers um, some of them um, perhaps don't have the official qualifications but it does depend in which uh, in country you're talking about but certainly in terms of the quality issues around materials the teaching and then, of course, we've got infrastructural um, challenges, which are not the same that are in the Global North. And the expectations that students will have a device um, and that the university will have Wi-Fi um, or even at school levels, um, uh, students and uh, learners in Europe have far more access than, for example, um, students in the Global South. But we are seeing some interesting changes in how different devices are being rolled out. So for example, in Africa, um, by and large, the, the device that people use most frequently is the mobile phone. So that has implications for how we prepare materials, because it's no use preparing materials that really would be optimized um, on a desktop computer or a laptop. Um, or perhaps have um, excessive use of very high definition video when that is not actually going to um, be possible. Um, also costs, uh, connectivity costs are particularly high in some of the developing countries. So um, we've got to be careful when we talk about OER being free. Uh, the, the content itself might very well be free, but to actually access that content, um, there is an opportunity cost. So we do have to take that into account and be careful that we don't overstate the free concept because then people expect something that is actually not possible to provide. The other thing is, I think in the Global South, um, because there are areas where there is perhaps limited connectivity or perhaps limited number of devices, uh, still, and probably for the next couple of years, we're still going to be looking at paper-based um, versions of materials. But that doesn't mean to say that 
they can't be open education. So in South Africa, for example, we've got a very big um, project called Siavula, which has been involved in providing open education resources that in fact the South African government has printed. Um, so we have to separate out the fact about materials being open and the way they're licensed and, and the fact that they may or may not be digital, uh, which in fact in Europe it's almost like they conflate the idea of open access being open access to materials on the internet that they, they're digital. That is not the case for all learners in the Global South, more particularly not for primary and secondary students. Um, um, university students have fewer challenges, but um, they're still not quite the same um, as they are in uh, countries in the Global North. Well, I think um, these sort of binary distinctions are always a bit tricky because um, you know, around the world people have tried to call these different groupings by different names. So we've had developing countries, developing countries, um, economically um, strong countries, economically challenged countries. We've had quite a few um, different terms being used, but primarily I think it's a, it's a power issue that, that has come with um, a financial strength from countries such as, or groupings such as the United States, um, Europe, um, and including um, countries, especially um, even those that are geographically in the global south, like Australia and New Zealand, they aren't necessarily part of that grouping where we haven't been as privileged um, in terms of making our knowledge um, available as the kind of de facto, what is valuable knowledge. And I think that's one of the challenges we have and opportunities we have, is up until now, the Global North, the publisher in the Global North have actually taken advantage of the fact that education from a Western perspective has kind of been what has been considered the de facto knowledge. And textbooks published in the US and in the UK and in Europe found their way into African universities, um, and especially into Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, not perhaps as much in South America. And I think up until now it's been too expensive to have materials developed for a particular context, so we've almost had to use materials that have been globally produced, as it were. But uh, Open Education Resources gives us the opportunity to actually make a change here. Um, if we've got materials that can be localized, if we've got materials that can be created from scratch in different um, contexts, we can actually now provide alternative ways of looking at it and opening up the debate on what valuable knowledge is construed to be. So I think um, OER, to be, we need to be careful that we don't just become a culture of reusers um, in the Global South. We actually have to encourage people to create and find ways in which to curate what we create so that it can be easily accessible, um, so that there are, there's an enriched environment in terms of knowledge. Um, so I think, yeah, in terms of the actual details of what, how it's going to play out, I will be in a better position to do this later on in the project, but those are my initial thoughts. valuable thing about having the Global South researchers is that we're looking at retaining the capacity within the Global South because part of the challenge has been um, that it's really been very valuable having the, the Global North researchers. I'm not saying we shouldn't have them and in fact we do have a hopefully a call for impact on OERs going out hopefully towards the end of May, beginning of June, which will specifically call for a South North, and we're specifically calling it South North um, collaboration, um, because we realise that some of the Northern researchers had more experience, and we want to work with people. But what we're trying to ameliorate is this um, global research coming into the global South, doing this really valuable research, 
leaving with the findings and recommendations, but actually leaving a gap in terms of the research capacity around methodologies. Um, and I think that's what we, we're really trying to strengthen. And I suppose it, we're looking at partnerships as well, so that we can actually get the best of both worlds. But by and large, we looking to grow the capacity of researchers in the South and that we're not constantly deferring to the global north um, because sometimes understanding the context makes all the difference in terms of the value of the research um, and its imp implementability um, in context. Um, so for example some of the research that is done we have a whole bunch of findings, but to what extent are those findings actually applied in context? And that's what we're trying to do, is to really find ways in which our research is providing evidence and then leading to implementable recommendations so that the research isn't research in and of itself. Now, that was actually quite a an issue of debate um, and what we were thinking about when we first looked at the sectors which we would look at was that we were trying to make our research as focused as possible so that we could actually get a kind of critical mass within a sector and where we could probably make the most difference with reusable global materials initially. So. Uh, but there was a debate around whether we should do post-secondary and in fact the post-secondary um, theme and sector only held until we found we had additional funding for the impact studies and then we were encouraged to perhaps extend it into the, the secondary areas because in terms of impact um, Certain types of impact, for example, around uh, cost reductions are most likely to happen in environments where there are they're, they're kind of economies of scale. So if you're looking at um, thousands and thousands of materials for primary schools and secondary schools, you're likely to see quite big cost savings there. And they are, in fact, easier to track because, generally speaking, the governments are involved in purchasing or procuring in some way the materials for those environments. Whereas the um, impact on cost for university students is a little more tricky to establish because there the cost burden is actually borne by the students themselves. So you wouldn't be able to go to one authority to get a sense of how many books have been purchased um, by students. Also because there's quite a, a strong resale process amongst the students themselves on an informal basis. So tracking some of the cost saving issues just in the um, post secondary would prove quite difficult. Um, so it was a it was a debate and we felt that it was probably worth opening up so we've actually morphed a little in that focus so as we've now got an, uh, additional funding from DFID um, to support some of the research and impact studies of OER in the Global South we have now um, kept our focus on education and in fact that education stretches right from the primary uh, to what we've called lifelong learning. Um, so it has made it a little broader. It will make the findings less um, sharp in the sense that we're not talking about one sector, but we're hoping that uh, the different um, perspectives will give us a, a richness um, and give us ideas of where research needs to be undertaken in the kind of next round. Let me say, we have um, a range of ideas about openness. And in fact, probably to answer that question, we ought to have um, 
little video of what we discussed at one of our workshops because um, yes openness can be seen in terms of openness um, and licensing which is often the thing um, openness in terms of costs which is the other um, but in fact we realized that for our study we're going to have to define openness um, in quite subtle ways and we in fact are busy in that with that process because for example the idea of an open university has the, con the sort of underlying understanding of openness as an admission openness an entry into an institution so often when students or lecturers um, general citizens come across the idea of open education, there's the expectation that it's an admission into some kind of institution. And we use that understand that, that idea of open in slightly different ways in open education resources, which is uh, access to use rather than a right into um, a, an institution. So um, at the moment, how are we going about this? So we haven't, haven't made a kind of definitive, um, we haven't taken a definitive stab at, at openness yet. But the process that we're going through is that we are conducting um, uh, bi-monthly uh, webinars where we bring our researchers together synchronously, which is pretty tricky because we work across 16 time zones. But the materials are available for afterwards if people aren't able to um, attend. And what we do then is we take um, a, ver a concept at a time. And then what we do with that is we try and define what we mean by that and then uh, apply it in the kinds of questions that we're going to be posing, either in our, um, uh, our one project which looks at a survey right across all the countries um, in the Global South that we've selected um, through some of our case studies, through interviews, um, sort of uh, document analysis, so that when we talk about open, is that the open we're looking for? So at the moment we're in the process of that. So I would, I think perhaps uh, um, defining what it is and some of the challenges that we faced around it and how come we came up with that final idea of open will probably be asked um, better at the end of the project but even now we're aware that when we are researching open education resources that we've got to be quite subtle to actually identify that we are in terms of construct validity that we're actually looking at what is open compared to what is an educational resource. So for example, we know, um, especially in Southeast Asia, but I'm sure in Africa as well, we know this because of the um, OER Asia um, project that's already run, that um, students uh, don't very easily differentiate between what is an open education resource and what is something that's open on the internet. The fact that what's on the internet is by default copyright is a concept that people do not appreciate. So in many instances, students are actually using materials, particularly on the internet, as if they were OER, as if they were open. So the fact that you can actually access it digitally, the fact that you can download it, in many people's eyes, is open. And for us, the, the open licensing is really important because of the attribution in the first instance, which is something that I think we've got to build a culture around that because that's certainly not a shared culture across the globe. The globe. Um, and then also in terms of making the reuse rights as easy as possible for people to see so that they know what to do with it. So they know in what ways these materials are open. Um, and right now that is a, a whole area of advocacy um, particularly amongst um, school children. Um, university, university students have a little stronger sense of um, attribution because of these, uh, the scariness of being caught plagiarizing. But children at primary schools and secondary schools, I think, from what we've seen so far, 
are using materials willy-nilly off the internet as if they were OER. Yes, and in fact, we, we've made a, a statement and we have a principle that we're wanting to uphold and that is to make our research open. So what we mean by that is rather than waiting right until the end of a research project where we have the findings and we publish that in an open access journal, what we're hoping to do is to make each stage of the research cycle open. That doesn't mean to say we're going to have everything up because clearly our research is messy and people don't have time to go through every little bit of messiness. So we will select, but for example, the fact that our proposals are available. We're going to make our literature reviews available. Our conceptual frameworks, why we chose what we did, alternatives, we'll make that available. The, the methodologies that we undertook, we've got quite a variety. And then how we went about um, our uh, question um, or instrument um, development process for surveys, questionnaires, focus groups, um, document analysis. And not, so not only sharing the final um, survey instruments or any of the instruments, but in fact kind of shining a light on some of the underlying assumptions that we've made. So uh, there is a, a much clearer understanding about why those particular questions were chosen. Um, we will then, um, and this is our biggest challenge, is to actually make our data open. Um, and that I'm less confident about at the moment because we, we haven't done it yet, but that's our intention. And in terms of our initial dissemination, we have an idea that instead of waiting for the final, final uh, report, that we'll be creating a dynamic research log, as it were, and building up the research as it goes along um, in a way in which the report structure is layered so you can get a summary and then you can get a summary of the projects but then if you want to delve deeper you can actually go into the actual questionnaires used in that particular project the actual data the list of references um, the people who are involved their contact details and this obviously will be dynamic um, in the sense that people can leave comments um, and ask questions on the actual document itself, or for example, challenge some of our um, assumptions. Um, so we're hoping in that way to make it um, slightly more dynamic and interactive than before. Uh, so these, I must say, uh, caveat is that these are intentions. I haven't seen, apart from the OER hub, which are making um, quite a lot of the data the visualization of the data available, which we are obviously going to connect into as well. Um, I haven't yet seen a research project, uh, certainly not an OER, there might be in other fields, where the entire research process is quite as transparent as this one. I just think it's such a privilege that we've been asked to undertake this research because uh, it is a bit of a disruptive um, activity because we are challenging um, traditional forms of teaching. We tradition we challenging traditional understandings of knowledge. Um, so in many instances, we actually been given the opportunity to ask questions about things that many people are just taking for granted um, and prompting people to think about different ways of doing things, but not merely from an advocacy perspective, but trying to find evidence for the claims that we're wanting to make. So in that respect, um, being given the privilege of not just accepting this idea, which is a, in many instances quite a no-brainer, I mean, why wouldn't you want to give people access to education resources? But to try and find actual evidence of how they're being used and perhaps what some of the unintended consequences are socially at quite a high level for how we do this and how we perhaps need to change some of our cultural ideas, 
um, but where we might need to restructure some of our educational institutions, but probably, most importantly, how we at an individual level, both as researchers, teachers, lecturers, policy makers, can actually make a difference as individuals.